is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My, my question is to the uh, Finance Minister. Um, Minister, the, uh, Don McGinty was certainly known for his reckless spending. Um, his finance minister uh, doubled our, our provincial debt and had record deficits. 2013 was your first full year as finance minister, and the deficit actually went up, not down. The deficit was $2 billion greater under your watch. So I'm going to ask you, Minister, you had more revenue come in. How did you actually do worse than Dalton McGuinty's finance minister? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Well, I appreciate the question, and I also referenced the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition to his own projections, which, by the way, were even worse than, had they, than what we did because we did cut spending, Mr. Speaker. We actually made and were disciplined in our determination in terms of reducing our spending, controlling that, which we do. We recognize that revenues are uh, much and lower than forecasted, and as a result, we take the necessary and appropriate steps to work towards our balance by 2017-18, and that's a prudent way. Now, the member opposite would claim that the best way to do this, Mr. Speaker, is to do across-the-board cuts, harm our recovery, and ensure that those that are looking for security and opportunity are cut off the system. We're not going to do that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, you know, Speaker. Of of course, I make the decisions to balance the budget, to send a signal Ontario is open for job creation again. Yeah. Is, isn't that what we're, we're here for? My, my question to you is, I, I, again, the 2012 deficit, the last year of the Dalton McGuinty government, was $9.2 billion. Instead of um, getting closer to balance, you actually increase the deficit. I mean, the, the win Liberals are actually more reckless in their spending than even Dalton McGuinty was. I recognize it's Order. a same crew in, in different chairs, but finance minister, you had $3 billion in additional revenue and the deficit got worse, not better. What kind of signal does that send to job creators about the ability of the province to attract new jobs and new investment? Thank you. <laughs> you see it, please? <coughs> you see it, please? Thank you. Minister Mr. Speaker, we are record breakers because what we've done Mr. Speaker, we've beaten our targets. We're well, but we, for four, five years in a row, we've exceeded the targets, and our deficit has actually been. I would uh, ask the member from the P and Carlton to, to withdraw. Speaker, carry on. And Mr. Speaker, it's necessary for us to always look for the long term and ensure that while short-term targets may be amended as required, we will always stay on target to balance the books by 2017-18 in a very prudent and pragmatic way. Every decision we're making, Mr. Speaker, is about creating jobs. It is why we've created over 450,000 net new jobs since the depth of the recession. It's why we've created over 650,000 net new jobs since 2003, Mr. Speaker. We are growing. The economy is growing because of the investments Thank and the you. stimulus that we've made. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, we are, we are making some progress. I did get the finance minister to admit that they are record breakers when it comes to debt in the province. Uh, and in fact, the finance minister now knows that under the Wynn McGinty Liberals, we actually have worse debt than California, considered the basket case in North America when it comes to debt. You, you've actually a record breaker now. You've surpassed California. And the concern I have is, you mentioned the long term, this, this is a, the, the most damaging policy in the long term to go deep in debt. That means we won't have money for things we care about, like help for special needs kids, the best technology in our hospitals. It means jobs will leave the province and go to Alberta or Saskatchewan. So, Minister, I think it took an, an extraordinary feat of incompetence to actually make the deficit bigger when you had more money coming in. So what concerns me is, under your, your budget leaking team, you're going to now have 39 new spending announcements question? $5.7 billion. My simple question is, where are you going to find the money? Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, as a result of the, the work and transformation that we've been doing, we're borrowing $23 billion less this year than anticipated. Our deficit has come down five years in a row, well, well ahead of what we had targeted. And we were the only government in all of Canada to actually cut spending year over year. We've controlled it at less than 1% for the last five years running, Mr. Speaker. And as a result of that, we've become the lowest cost government per capita anywhere in Canada, anywhere at all. And we're proud of that because of the work that we're doing 
collaboratively with our stakeholders. And more importantly, Mr. Speaker, we've already instituted 80 per cent of Don Drummond's recommendations, and it's now exceeded even his anticipated forecast of the work that we've done in the billions because of what we've made going forward. And the member erroneously makes reference to California as somehow that's a, a fair comparison. It is not, Mr. Speaker. We are the largest juris sub-national jurisdiction in the Thank world you. that borrows. They cannot. Thank you. Thank you. New question? The finance minister. Well, Speaker, if I offended Californians by comparing them to the wind liberals, I do apologize to California taxpayers. Let me, um, let me talk. I, I don't think what the minister said is keeping with the actual facts. Uh, the minister said that they've cut spending. No, spending has actually gone up dramatically under the liberals. The minister says they're the lowest cost jurisdiction. Minister, low cost jurisdictions do not run $11 billion deficits. I want to ask you one more thing. Uh, you know what? I'll go back because you didn't answer my question. This week, you're rolling out in your budget leaking team plan Order. an additional $400 million. I, I don't see where we're going to get that money. You're going to have 39 analysis for $5.7 billion total. Isn't your plan going to drive Ontario into receivership? Our plan is going to drive Ontario on the path to prosperity. Thank you. you see it, please? Thank you. Minister? <laughs> Um, the opposition member wants to talk about the facts. So let's please talk about the facts. All this is is gimmicks and slogans and four nation type politics, Mr. Speaker. Let's talk about the facts. We did cut spending last year well beyond what was ever anticipated. Mr. Speaker, we are the lowest per capita cost government because of the work we've done. Uh, substantially lower than all other provinces, even the federal government, Mr. Speaker. And we will announce these answers in the budget in this house mr speaker nowhere else like the member has absolutely been making clear thankfully to them the member from renfrew nipissing pembroke and the member from prince Edward hastings now that's twice please <laughs> thankfully to the opposition now Ontarians are well aware of our investments that we're planning to go forward because they recognize that that is yes, important, sir. Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Is this, is this hard to ask the finance minister questions when his grip on the facts seems superficial at best? Um, your deficit actually went up. Uh, you, um, you actually increased the deficit in your first full year as finance minister. I'm using your own numbers. I'll use your own language. You rolled out on Wednesday a very, uh, almost an embrace of mediocrity. You said Ontario's long-term growth is going to be lower than the global average, weaker than the Americans, weaker than the British, weaker than the Australians, weaker than the other nine provinces. And that's if everything goes according to your plan. I believe Ontario can do a lot better than that, Speaker. I've got a plan to create a million jobs in our province, an Ontario that leads again. The minister boasts about his 39 uh, big spending initiatives of $5.7 billion of more borrowed money. I want to ask the minister, when we look through what you're announcing in your budget outside of the House, why is there not one single idea on how to put Ontarians back to work in this great project? Thank you. Minister? Mr. Speaker, uh, the details and the announcements will be made in this House nowhere else. So we're going to be we're going to be illustrating all of these initiatives in our budget in this House. But let me say this, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite talks about the facts. Here's a great fact that everyone should be well aware of: our deficit, our deficit. That's enough. Dude. I'll send somebody home. Mr. Speaker, our deficit is actually $900 million lower than the Tim Hudak PCs promised for this time in their 2011 PC platform. They themselves projected a higher deficit, a higher spending number than we've actually achieved. We're outpacing them, Mr. Speaker, Answer. and they have the audacity that they, that they could do otherwise. Thank you. Final supplementary. Yeah, again, Speaker, it's, it's, it's difficult to... Um, get answers from the finance minister when it seems like his grasp of the basic numbers is tangential at, at best. Uh, again, the deficit uh, under Dwight Duncan, your predecessor, was $9.2 billion. You've increased it by over $2 billion, despite more revenue coming in. I, I think that when you're adding on more and more debt, 
That challenges our ability to provide the services that we care about, and it chases jobs out of the province of Ontario. You say the best we can do is trail the other nine provinces for the next 20 years. I say we can lead again, Speaker. My plan will do exactly that. So, to Minister, when, when businesses, when job creators look at Ontario, they see that you're on path to tripling our debt. You've doubled our hydro rates, and we have the worst red tape in all of Canada. Is it any wonder they're investing in other provinces, in other states? I've got a plan to bring the jobs back here to the province of Ontario. My million jobs, but if you have no plan, why don't you give our plan a try? It's going to work. Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Minister of Finance. Your people and we are your them the next Mr. Speaker, I, I find it passing strange. The member has just made reference to the fact that we can't we, we have to afford the debt that we maintain because that is critically important that's what we measure our net debt to gdp and ensuring that it takes the proper directory so we don't pass the burden of debt onto future generations one of the ways we do that mr speaker ensuring that there's greater prosperity and economic revival we've been enhancing that they have chosen to do, the, to do the opposite because we're making the investments necessary to prop up our economy and create those jobs which have been created, which under their leadership would not, Mr. Speaker. So we will take those steps necessary. We have made a very dynamic and inviting business climate because we have more businesses investing in Ontario than in most jurisdictions in North America. We have more startups in Ontario than all of Canada combined. That's a strong signal. They want to go back to the days of assembly line manufacturing that we can't compete. We need to compete on those jobs for tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, please. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. It's unfortunate the Premier is at a campaign-style event instead of being in the Legislature today to answer the questions. But uh, when the Premier took over the Ontario Liberal Party, Speaker, she said, and I quote, we are going to build on the legacy of Dalton. Can the Acting Premier tell us whether this government is still so proud of that legacy of Dalton McGuinty? Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, uh, I am enormously proud of the progress that we have made and continue to make under Premier Wynne. Um, the member opposite uh, feels it necessary to uh, uh, to comment on the uh, the attendance of our Premier Speaker. What I would like to say is that our Premier has a very strong record, not only when it comes to attending question period, but to answering questions when she's here, Speaker. Um, the, uh, we, we've, made, we've made significant progress, Speaker. Uh, last week, our Finance Minister announced our revised deficit uh, will meet our target by $400 million, Speaker. We gained 13,400 net new jobs in March, and our unemployment rate fell 0.2% uh, to 7.3%. Speaker, we are implementing Drummond's recommendations. We're 80% of the way there to increase efficiency. Thank you. We've beaten our uh, Thank deficit. You. Seated, please. <laughs> Supplementary. Well, it is unfortunate, Speaker, that uh, the Premier couldn't be here today to answer the questions. But Stop the clock. No, actually, keep it going. Sorry. Uh, it is not the tradition of this place to reference anyone's attendance in this house, and I'd say not to do it again, please. Carry on. Speaker, with regards to the ongoing investigation. Order. Stop the clock. We're going to get order. Carry on, please. With regards to the ongoing investigation by the OPP, the Premier said, and I quote, that is not the way government should operate. That is not the way a Premier's office should conduct itself, unquote. Now, she's scrambling to distance herself from the Premier that she worked for, she served with, and she helped elect. Can the Acting Premier tell us whether the Liberals are still proud of the Dalton McGuinty legacy? Deputy Premier. You know, Speaker, when it comes to uh, our Premier's response to the issues around the gas plants, uh, I think that uh, any, any, uh, any uh, observer speaker, would know that, uh, that there has been more openness and transparency from this Premier than we have seen uh, before. Speaker. 
when the Premier um, became, became Premier, she made it Order. a priority to bring openness and transparency to this issue, and we have taken appropriate steps. One of the things we've done, Speaker, is we've improved record-keeping right across government. Answer. A directive to all political staff has been sent out. We've got mandatory training in place now. We're improving our archiving requirements. Thank you. The you see the place? Final supplementary. Speaker, I think Ontarians will be uh, dis oh, sorry, I should take that back. Uh, people expect their government uh, to be open and accountable, Speaker. But instead of getting straightforward answers or actual accountability, we have a Liberal government pretending they've never heard of the leader that they served with for a decade, and a Premier who finds a lot of time to talk to lawyers but can't manage to make it to work. Does the acting Premier think this is fair to families? Deputy Premier. Um, well, Speaker, I would hope that the member opposite will support the Accountability Act because that will prohibit the willful deletion of records. It would create a penalty, Speaker. We have been very, very open. Uh, 400,000 pages. Think about that for a minute. 400,000 pages of documents have been provided to the Justice Committee, including 30,000 pages from the Premier's office. Speaker, it's important that we get the facts out there. It is uh, not helpful when there are unfounded allegations, Speaker. And we will continue to get the work done that the people of this province expect us to get done. Thank you. New question. The leader of the Thank you, third Speaker. Party. My uh, question is all, again to the acting premier. Uh, on Friday, New Democrats uh, wrote to the premier to ensure that the former deputy chief of staff to the premier, Laura Miller, could participate in the investigation about the wiping of government computers. Have the Ontario Liberals been in touch with the BC Liberals to ensure that Laura Miller can return to Ontario to be part of this investigation? Deputy Premier. Government House Leader. Mr. So, Speaker, uh, we have the Justice Committee right now is looking into the matter of the That's gas plants, Mr. Court. Speaker. They have uh, every opportunity, they have the responsibility and the right to call whichever witnesses they see fit. There's a process in place. You'd be familiar with that, Mr. Speaker, if they do uh, uh, encounter any problems oh, in terms of uh, calling forward that witness, Mr. Speaker. But I would uh, simply point out to the leader of the third party that the government has been cooperating fully, not only with the Justice committee, of which the Premier herself was the one who asked for its mandate to be broadened and its powers increased, but we have also, Mr. Speaker, uh, been cooperating fully with the Ontario Provincial Police in their investigation, and, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to cooperate with everyone who's looking into this uh, very serious matter. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the gas plant scandal has now crossed the Rockies, and B.C. Liberal Premier Christy Clark isn't saying whether uh, she thinks that Laura Miller should participate in the ga gas plant investigation here in Ontario. So. Will the Ontario Liberal government contact the B.C. Liberal government to explain how important it is for Ontarians to get to the bottom of the waste and the $1.1 billion that was spent on the gas plant uh, moving and the wiping of computers in the Premier's office? I thought the NDP was Speaker, uh, about social Again, issues. I mean, we're—, we're you know, the other week, I, I commented that I think a lot of members are watching old Ellery Queen reruns. Perhaps uh, the leader of the third party is watching Perry Mason a little too much. Mr. Speaker, there is an ongoing police investigation. Let's have the police uh, undertake their work. There is a committee of this legislature, Mr. Speaker, which is considering this matter and considering which uh, witnesses to, to bring forward. It is their right to put forward uh, that list, Mr. Speaker, and to engage those witnesses put forward. Let's leave it to the committee to do their work. I can speak for uh, the government of Premier Wynne, Mr. Speaker, and say that we have cooperated fully with the Justice Committee. I appeared in front of it, Mr. Speaker. The Premier wow. appeared several times, as did the Minister of Energy and other members of this caucus, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we sir. Will continue to cooperate with the uh, Justice Committee. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the utter arrogance of the House Leader of the Liberal Party, of the Liberal government, that would make jokes about the work the opposition is trying to do to hold this government to account. Speaker, 
of the gas plant scandal has become a nationwide scandal, and Ontarians are worried whether the Liberal government, wondering rather whether the Liberal government will do its part to ensure that a key Liberal witness participates in the ongoing investigations that are being done, not only by the police but by the, the members of this very legislature. Does the acting premier agree that it is important that Laura Miller and Peter Feist come back from British Columbia to be part of the gas plant investigation? And will the acting Western. premier commit that the Ontario Liberals will send that message to the BC Thank you. Liberals? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, again, the government will cooperate fully with the Justice Committee and with the OPP investigation. But if that honourable member wants to talk about arrogance, Mr. Speaker, perhaps she should comment about her amnesia of the fact that it was the New Democratic Party as well as the Progressive Conservative Party that opposed the very gas plants that we're talking about. The fact of the matter that all three parties of this legislature, Mr. Speaker, are on record opposing those gas plants. And if she wants Order. to talk about arrogance, the fact that she has conveniently forgotten that fact, Mr. Speaker, because it makes her case well not as straightforward, Mr. Speaker. If she wants to talk about arrogance, Mr. Speaker, then let's talk about her amnesia when it comes to that unfortunate. Answer. Fact, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from the Pian Carlton. My question is as well to the government House Leader. In the twilight of his days here as a member of provincial parliament, can he confirm for this House that the individual who wiped, allegedly wiped clean at the behest of the former Premier's Chief of Staff 24 hard drives in that office? That he had a criminal record, yes or no? Oh. Mr. Speaker, you know, again, there is an ongoing OPP investigation, Mr. Speaker. I think we should allow the OPP to undertake their work. And what we heard, Mr. Speaker, from uh, the officer who appeared in front of the committee last week were two things. First of all, that the matter in hand dealt with Mr. Livingston under the former Premier and also that members should stay out of it. And Mr. Speaker, I am very, very pleased that our Premier has sought some legal advice, and this is taking legal action, Mr. Speaker, because what we are asking that member and the Leader of the Opposition is to retract their statements and to apologize, Mr. Speaker. And what's interesting, Mr. Speaker, is that member in particular has had some experience yes, with this and has had to do it in the past, Mr. Speaker. So perhaps based on that experience, she should take the Thank same you. action. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I'm going to go back to the Minister of Government Services. This is actually a pretty big deal. We want to know is if this is the policy of the Liberal Minister of Energy, come to and order. the leader of the Ontario Liberal Party to employ people with a criminal record without undergoing a security check and to give them unfettered access to the government's most secret information to allegedly then destroy that information to public scrutiny. Two Ontario judges said this individual was, quote, inconsistent as a witness and, quote, lacked credibility. But it was the minister's government, his caucus, and his party who up until last weekend allowed this individual to access some of the most sens sensitive government, legislative, and party documents. In fact, the minister of Western. government services has been the government house leader the entire time. As a constitutionally responsible minister Thank you. of the IT of the government, Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. What about Chris Froggett? Mr. Speaker, much of what was said by that member. Allegations which are unproven, Mr. Speaker, are in fact the topic of the OPP investigation. Let's leave it with the OPP. But again, Mr. Speaker, the honourable member seemed to uh, need some reminding of uh, January 31, 2005, when she put out a statement that I'd like to read in part to the House. The operators of www.bluedraft.com, Mr. Speaker, that was a, uh, a blog that the member was involved with, Ms. Lisa McLeod, the member from Nepean Carlton, and Chris Froggart would like to sincerely apologize to Maureen oh. Murphy Macon and Rick Morgan for wrongfully implicating them in an erroneous oh. story in January 2004 wow. revolving around the decision by former PC leader Peter McKay that. not to seek the leadership of the new Conservative Party of Canada. We had that the facts as reported in the article were false and unfortunately based on a misleading source and it goes on and on Mr. Speaker that's all we're asking the Thank you. To do. Thank it's you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock.
Um, it, it is not, uh, it's not acceptable to read anything into the record that you cannot say that is parliamentary, uh, unparliamentary language, so I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Yeah. Yeah. Those that decide to preempt what I'm trying to do will also have the same uh, problem. New question. The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Acting Premier. The government keeps claiming that they're being open, but reports are still kept secret. It was because of an OPP anti-rackets branch warrant that we learned that the Ontario Public Services Cybersecurity Branch completed a report on the Premier's office computers that were wiped clean, allegedly, by Peter Feist. Will the Acting Premier make that report public today? Deputy Premier. Minister of Government Services. Okay. Mr. Speaker, again, I, I think this is a selective uh, a selective uh, uh, presentation of the facts. If the honourable member reads the document that was released by the court uh, about a week and a half ago, it makes reference to a number of activities, Mr. Speaker, including the one he was just referenced, which are all part of the ongoing OPP investigation, Mr. Speaker. And I want to state very clearly, Mr. Speaker, the investigation is entirely independent as it should be. OPP investigators have been working with a federal crown attorney from the public, public prosecution service. Service of Canada from the beginning to ensure its independence. The, oper the member opposite seems to be suggesting that the government should somehow be uh, interfering or inserting itself in the investigation, Mr. Speaker. That would be entirely Answer. inappropriate, Mr. Speaker. And I Get think Michael the Pearl good Pearl advice Pearl. that we heard from the OPP officer last Thursday is let's allow them to do their work. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, again to the Acting Premier. We learned that the Liberal Party itself also has a secret report. Only when the allegations about Peter Feist were made public in an unsealed police warrant did the government say, quote, an internal investigation was conducted. The company was informed yesterday that its services at the party office were terminated. Will the acting premier tell Ontarians what that internal investigation found? Yeah. Mr. Speaker. Again, the honourable member should uh, uh, check his facts, Mr. Speaker, as should much of the opposition. Fad is, as uh, was announced, and I believe I said it here in the legislature, or perhaps the Premier, when uh, those court documents were uh, unsealed, we looked into the matter and determined the two contracts that we have made public, Mr. Speaker, and uh, the uh, details of that, as is appropriate, Mr. Speaker, were turned over to the police. They will determine if it's relevant to their the investigation, Mr. Job. Speaker. In fact, the OPP has the leadership in this independent investigation, and the advice that we heard, very prudent advice last week from the OPP officer in front of the Answer. Justice Committee, is let's allow the OPP to do their work and stop, stop this amateur detective of our here in the legislature. Thank you. The question the member from Scarborough Rouge River. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Today on World Health Day, I want to raise the issue of one of the most prevalent and debilitating chronic diseases facing our province today. Nearly one and a half million Ontarians live with diabetes. Diabetes is an illness that disproportionately impacts those from the South Asian and African communities in this province, and the prevalence of diabetes in Ontario is rising. Speaker, like many other diseases, awareness is the first step to living a healthier life. Due to the stigma that is still attached to diabetes, many diabetics do not openly disclose that they suffer from it. Could the minister tell us what can be done to address the needs of Ontarians with diabetes? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Scarborough Rouge River for this very important question, Speaker. Diabetes does affect many families right across the province, and that's why people living with diabetes who need help managing their condition have much access to much more services uh, than were available a decade ago. Later today, I'll be participating in the launch of the Canadian Diabetes Association's Diabetes Charter for Canada. This charter will give people with diabetes a stronger voice. It articulates a set of rights held by those suffering from the disease, and it advocates for timely, patient-centered care. This is the approach we're driving throughout our health care system. We're working to encourage patients uh, to be at the centre of their de decision-making. 
Part of this is a focus on public education to help people with diabetes manage their illness, and that's why we've yes, worked sir. to put a new video to help diabetics properly monitor their blood glucose levels, available at ontario.ca slash diabetes. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The information the minister provided on the diabetes charter is interesting and is something that will be able to aid all of those who suffer from this disease. In my riding of Malvern Community is serviced by Taibu Community Health Center. This organization provides localized care that is catered to the community needs. This localized care at Taibu includes a diabetes education program. The goal of this program is to improve the quality of life for people affected by type 2 di diabetes by providing a culturally and linguistically appropriate service and high standards of diabetes care and education that promotes self-management. Like this program, there are several other examples of how our health care system is working to improve the lives of those living with diabetes Question. and encouraging everyone to take steps to prevent diabetes. Speaker, can the minister please share of the other initiatives our government has taken to fight diabetes and Thank keep you. Ontarians healthy? Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. I'm proud to say that under our government, every Ontarian with diabetes who wants a family doctor gets one. And since 2008, our Ontario diabetes strategy has improved access and quality of care for Ontarians with diabetes. We're the first province in Canada to fully fund insulin pumps for children and adults with type 1 diabetes. We provide screening and early detection programs. Uh, more than 2,700 high-risk individuals were, um, were screened last year. And we've established six centres for complex diabetes care and increased the number of diabetes education teams from 220 to 321. But the best way to fight diabetes is to prevent it in the first place, and that's why we've introduced a proposed legislation, the Making Healthier Choices Act, to help parents make the Answer. best choice for their kids and families by providing nutritional information on menus. I urge all members to support this legislation. Thank you. No question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Uh, many in our caucus have spent a lot of time getting to the bottom of the gas plant scandal. We've all seen your systematic attempt to keep the truth from coming out. In fact, many of us were victims of your attempts. You produce some documents and say that's everything. We push, and two weeks later, we get 20,000 more documents. You told us it was $40 million to cancel. We push. And the Auditor General tells us it's $1.1 billion. We bring contempt. You bring prorogation. You ask, we ask you to bring in the OPP. You laugh. We bring in the OPP, we get damning evidence. You try to silence our leader, we get suspicious. If we had stopped at any of the roadblocks blocks you put up, we wouldn't have learned the cost of this scandal or the depths you've Question. gone to cover this up. What are you hiding? Remember, we'll withdraw. Withdraw. Deputy Premier. To government services. You know, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I feel like that, that guy in the old movies after the Broadway plays and everyone sits around waiting for the reviews to come in. Well, Mr. Speaker, the reviews are in on how that party, particularly the leader, has handled this uh, uh, issue, Mr. Speaker. And let me let me share some of the, the quotes. Say? Headline in the Sudbury Star, April 3rd. Sudbury the leader Star. of the opposition loses credibility with cover-up claims. Again, the Sudbury Star, April 3rd. The leader of the opposition engaged in unnecessary and ugly vitriol over the computer hard drive controversy. Star is right. Sudbury. The member from Renfrew, Nepissing, Pembroke is warned. Warned. You know what that means. Thank you. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, Sudbury Star, April 3rd. If the Leader of the Opposition is prone to such ill-advised remarks in opposition, voters might well Sir. wonder how he can be trusted as Premier. Globe and Mail, April 1st. The Conservative right. Leader's aggressive Thank attempts you. to score. Oh. Thank you. 
Acting Premier, uh, you can all laugh, but we have said all along that the deletion, destruction and denials were going to be a bigger scandal than the $1.1 billion gas plant cancellation. It exposes what's at the very core of the Mr. Liberal Community Party. Social you went to great to pains to block any evidence from ever coming forward. You turned over documents, we fought and got more. You deleted emails, we got them restored. You destroyed emails, we call in the OPP. You've gone to great lengths all along the way to stop us from ever getting to the truth. And now we know why. We learn of widespread deletion of documents in the very office of the Premier. What's so damning that you had to destroy those emails? Question, Thank you. Sure. Mr. Speaker, uh, a number of my colleagues have asked for more. I've got more. Globe and Mail, April 1st. The Conservative leaders' aggressive attempts to score points without orders to back them up are reminding Ontario voters why they haven't warmed up to them. Toronto Star, April 1st. The Leader of the Opposition is inventing fanciful scenarios about the first day of Wynne's premiership. Globe and Mail editorial, April 1st. Ontario Progressive Conservative Leader Mr. Hudak is on thin legal ice. Globe and Mail, April 1st. The Leader of the Opposition's reckless allegations against Wynne are reminders of previous mistakes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the review speak for themselves. The fact is, this is a serious issue. The OPP are looking into it. Let's allow the OPP to continue their work. There was very clear last Thursday, yes, Mr. Speaker, in the testimony to the committee, this is about what happened under the previous Premier's Thank watch, you. Mr. Speaker, and they are Thank simply you. wrong. Thank you. New question. The member from Bramley, Gore, Moulton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Mr. Speaker, when did the Liberal government first become aware that the Peter Feist, who was working the for this Liberal to Party, was the very same Peter Feist who the OPP information to obtain, according to that document, staffers alleged that he was seen wiping the computers in the Premier's office. Minister of Services. Again, Mr. Speaker, I, I believe that I, I answered the question to a colleague. I believe I answered the question several days ago that when uh, this court document was made public uh, uh, a week ago Thursday that we looked into the matter, Mr. Speaker, and uh, information came to light about uh, two contracts, Mr. Speaker. We uh, made that information public here in question period. I believe the Premier commented on in a scrum, and uh, several days later, Mr. Speaker, I believe it was a Sunday, uh, Mr. Feist's company was told that uh, uh, their services were no longer needed by the Ontario Liberal Party. Mr. Speaker, that has uh, uh, been a matter of public record now for uh, a week or 10 days, Mr. Speaker, since this story uh, first broke. No question on auto insurance. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Will the acting Premier tell Ontarians what the internal investigation found that led the Liberals to distancing themselves from the Peter Feist? More, from Peter Price, more than a year after, according to the OPP information to obtain, sta staffers alleged that they saw him doing work on computers in the Premier's office. Wow. You know, Give Paul Mr. Miller Speaker, a question. I'm, I'm, I'm patient, Mr. Speaker. About 10 days ago, Mr. Speaker, a court document came forward that talked about some of the details of an OPP investigation, an investigation which has been a matter of public record, I believe, for about a year or so, Mr. Speaker. And what that court document suggested is that there are allegations, serious yet unproven, against Mr. Livingston, the former Chief of Staff to the former Premier. What we have learned over and over again, Mr. Speaker, in both that court document and testimony before the committee is there is an ongoing investigation, Mr. Speaker, of the OPP. What we also learned with the advice from the OPP is that the best thing for us to do is to stop playing amateur hour here in the legislature, Mr. Speaker, allow the OPP to finish their investigation and reach whatever conclusions they see fit and then Answer. proceed through the justice system if that is the case, Mr. Speaker. The honourable member and his colleagues are being reckless and they're being irresponsible. Thank you. New question. The member from Mississauga Streetsville. Well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this question is for the Minister of Education. As the Minister knows, one of the issues we've dealt with in high-growth boards, such as the Peel District School Board, is funding provided for special education through the high-needs amount. I have spoken with our board, 
and responded to questions from some parents and school councils in the western Mississauga communities of Lisgar, Meadowvale and Streetsville. Our concern is with how equitable the high-needs funding is. Last week at Lisgar Middle School, I spoke with about four dozen parents and educators along with the Chair and the Director of Education at the Peel District School Board to discuss special needs funding provided through the grants for student needs. Would the Minister provide the House an update on how some of the inequities that existed are being addressed this year and how funding is provided for students with Great special question. needs? Great thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Streetsville for his question. And we have indeed heard from his community as well as others about the needs to address the high needs amount for special education through the grants for student needs. Boards have uh, correctly observed that uh, there are funding inequities because the data on which the old model is based is out of date. We need to update the demographic data. So we've been working with uh, education stakeholders and actually a number of outside experts getting their advice over the last few years on how we can update the SPECED funding model. We uh, are taking their advice, and this year we've introduced a four-year-old uh, four-year phase in of a different funding model for high-needs uh, students, and which sir? reflects the expert advice. So the Peel District School Board, amongst several others, will in fact see their high-needs amounts increase. Thank you. Supplementary. As the minister knows, one of the many ways in which we invest in people is to build our education system. The minister has already described one of the ways we support school boards to ensure that they have the resources to deliver a high-quality education for our students. Another way we invest in education is making sure we have the facilities for that high-quality education to be delivered in. Speaker, um, this year the ministry has approved three new elementary school projects worth more than $45 million for the Peel District School Board, wow, which serves news. Mississauga and Brampton. These new schools will add to the 61 schools that are built, planned or under construction in the Peel District School Board and that have received funding since 2003. Speaker, Peel Region continues to grow rapidly and we need the Ministry of Education to Question. continue to invest in the people choosing to call Peel home. Would the minister explain to the House how funding decisions and capital thank investments you. are made? That's okay. Thank you, Minister. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, as the member noted, I was in the riding next to him in Brampton West recently to announce funding for three new schools in the Peel District School Board. Uh, that's part of the $12 billion investment in new schools and major additions that we've made since uh, 2003. But the process is this. The board submit their capital requests each October to the ministry. They're required to uh, provide detailed business cases. This year, we received uh, requests for 260 projects worth over $2.6 billion. So what happens is that my ministry goes through those detailed business cases, looks at a number of factors, and this uh, year we were pleased to announce that we're providing funding for 78 capital Answer. projects, including 39 new schools, 30 additions, and eight renovations in Thank boards you. all across Ontario. Thank you. New question. A member from North Simple. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Ministry of Energy. Minister, we know how deeply involved your predecessor, Mr. Bentley, was in the gas plant's cancellation decision. I want to know your involvement in this file since you have been there over a year. Well, this Minister. is an energy file, and the expertise lies within the Ministry of Energy. I want to know what contribution or critical path you provided to the Premier on the cancellation file. We know your ministry conducted an internal review. What did Minister you find? portfolio Were come to order. files deleted in your ministry? Thank you. Minister of Energy. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, when I was appointed Minister of Energy uh, approximately a year ago, I devoted all of my time to working on a new long-term energy plan. Exactly. Uh, we did province-wide consultation in every corner. We consulted with the uh, uh, First Nations people, uh, and we came forward with an agenda that uh, has been very, very well accepted by stakeholders across the board, including environmentalists, including unions, people in the nuclear sector, Mr. Speaker, renewables, hydro. My involvement, uh, to, be, uh, to be fair to the question, Mr. Give Speaker, has been zero in terms of my engagement. Uh, everything had taken place beforehand, and uh, I was looking to the future, and I concentrated Answer. my efforts Give on Randy having a, a very effective electricity system in the province of Ontario. Two supplementary. Again, to the minister, Ontario's privacy commissioner has said, and I quote, in this day and age, Ignorance is no excuse. Transparency of government activities reflected in their records is essential to freedom and liberty. I agree with the Commissioner. Transparency and accountability is paramount to delivering good government. Ontarians still don't know everything about your government scandal. Minister, has, how has your office been involved with the OPP investigation? And further, were any files on any computers in your office or your ministry deleted or wiped clean by the accused Liberal Party techie, Mr. Feist? Thank you. The uh, member from Dufferin Caledon will come to order. Government House Leader. Quite frankly, very pleased, the honourable member mentioned Dr. Ann Kabuki and the Information Privacy Commissioner. Let me, uh, let me share some quotes, you'll want to hear this, of what Dr. Ann Kabukian said about the current government. In July 26, 2013, she said, I think on a go-forward basis, the government is, is looking to change things. The government is dedicating to opening up access to government data. Commission June 25, right. 2013, the government, with respect to my investigation and the work that we've done— Remember from Prince Hastings, Edward Hastings, come to order. Any cooperation we needed was there. June 13, 2013, I have commended the Premier Kathleen Wynne's government's approach to dealing with this issue, referencing the staff training program she instituted and the memo circulated by her Chief of Staff. June 25, 2013, I'm pleased, I'm pleased now to report that the new government has acted proactively Answer. to address the recommendations made in my report. Mr. Speaker, I will let the words of the Information Privacy Commissioner speak Thank for you. themselves. Before we go to the next question, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, come to order. New question, the member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, Ontario's correctional system is in crisis. With increased violence, persistent overcrowding, and class action lawsuits against the government, Ontarians learned today through FOI that there were 3,000 prisoner on prisoner attacks of the in 2012 to 2013, an increase of 30 per cent from five years ago. This rise in violence comes at the same time as overcrowding in correctional facilities, with almost half of Ontario's jails above capacity last year alone. Will this government act now to address the overcrowding and stop the violence in Ontario jails? Thank you. Deputy Premier. The Attorney General. Yes, Mr. President, I uh, thank uh, the uh, member thank you, Mr. Speaker. for uh, her question. Uh, of course, you know, we have uh, violence in, uh, in uh, the workplace, but uh, that's why we track uh, statistics like inmate on inmate violence to help us determine if our policy needs to change in order to deliver effective and efficient correctional service to meet the need of a changing offender population. Uh, as we know, you know, inmate can be difficult at times and unpredictable. So, despite uh, best effort, like I said, you know, violence does occur in our jail facility. So, we have invested uh, uh, approximately $10 million, Mr. Speaker, in new surveillance camera system in our larger facility. This is to uh, enhance uh, our monitoring capacity. Answer. We have uh, increased staff in our facilities, and we are training uh, new staff to add to in our facility. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Speaker, obviously more needs to be done. Too many inmates within our system are released back into the community after experiencing violence in custody, which is not only inhumane but puts public safety at risk. During his eight months at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre, Glenn Johnson was beaten, stabbed with a pencil and suffered multiple concussions. Some inmates like Adam Cargis at EMDC do not live to tell the tale and die during their incarceration. What will it take for this government to act and address the many issues in Ontario's jails? Thank you. General. There has been uh, a lot of improvement in our jail system. We have opened uh, two new facilities, modern facilities. We, have, uh, we are modernizing our old facilities. We, are, uh, we uh, stopped the closing of Sarnia Jail. We have added 2,000 uh, uh, new beds into the facilities. So we wanted to make sure that both, you know, the inmate and the staff are uh, safe in in the workplace, and we will uh, continue, you know, to improve. We are training new staff. Uh, we have uh, hired approximately 200 to 300 correctional officers in 2014, and approximately the same number will be hired in. 2015. We uh, additionally yes, uh, recruit uh, graduate over the past six months 188 new recruitment, and we will continue to add Thank the you. tools to be able to keep everyone safe. Thank you. New question. The member from Scarborough Agent Court. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, last fall, our ministry, your ministry has undertaken a variety of open houses to discuss how best reform the land use planning system. Residents in my riding of Scarborough Agent Court want our government to ensure that the planning system remains responsive to the changing needs of our communities while ensuring that we support a municipality, Ontario development and construction industry. Many people think about development challenges in downtown Toronto, whereas community like mine, Scarborough Asian Court, face similar concerns. Uh, my residents are also concerned about how development changes affect the community. So, Minister, through you, Speaker, through the Minister, can you please explain to my constituents what our government is doing to ensure that they will have a voice on how Scarborough would develop? Thank you, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, thank you very much, and I want to thank the, uh, the member for the question. Our government believes in having a strong land use planning system that gives municipalities the tools to manage growth so we can build the cities and towns we want to live in, work, and raise a family. I can understand, however, why your constituents would find the current system a, a bit difficult to navigate. In fact, we've heard from municipal leaders, planning officials, developers, and the public that the rules can be too complex and the delays and appeals too frustrating. That's why our government is moving forward with a refresh of this important system by listening to everyday Ontarians, municipal politicians, and community groups at regional workshops. And those workshops, Speaker, were conducted right across the province, uh, Kitchener-Waterloo, Ottawa, Sault Ste. Marie, Mississauga, Toronto, and in my home community of Thunder Bay. So, Speaker, as a result of that, we're looking forward to continuing the work that was done by the former minister to ensure that the land use planning system is going to work for all Ontarians. Answer. Thank you. Question. Thank you, Speaker. I'm pleased to hear that our government is giving municipalities the tools to be able to plot their own destiny and building communities that work for the residents. But despite the tools that municipalities have regarding development, projects can still be contentious. In fact, across Toronto, there are projects that worry the local councillors, the community, or even the city planners, and they believe that Toronto should be outside the Ontario Municipal Board. My writing in Scarborough Agent Court, they are sympathetic towards removing the OMB, worried that this sort of change would make it even more difficult and expensive to challenge projects that believe are out of place in their community, and we will have to go through the court system. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please explain to my constituents the importance of well-structured land use planning system and the importance of the Ontario Municipal Board? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, thank you, and again, I want to thank the member for the question. We do, of course, understand how important well-planned development is for our communities, and that's why the OMB is so critical. And we know the OMB has made decisions from time to time that are contentious in some of our communities, and that's why during this review, our government has listened to constructive ideas surrounding the OMB. 
The OMB makes dispute resolution easier, it's cheaper, and it's faster for community groups and municipalities than the courts. That's important, Speaker. We need to all remember that. And it plays an important role in hearing land use appeals, attempting to, to uh, balance the provincial planning policy with local planning decisions and community interests. However, suggestions that we have received from the third party about how to reform the planning system, they're not solutions, Speaker. The proposed changes, they're haphazard, they're piecemeal, and they would only increase the cost and time spent by community groups and municipalities to appeal planning disputes. That's why Answer. our government can move forward with a land use planning refresh that will deal fairly with all of the communities from north to south while ensuring that as our communities grow, they remain sustainable, so take that stronger, in. and more vibrant. Thank you. So your question, the member from Burlington. Yeah. To the Minister of Finance. Minister, you may recall last uh, pardon me, that several Liberal cabinet ministers quit last year. Laurel Broughton, Margaret Best, your predecessor Dwight Duncan, even the Premier jumped ship. Titanic. So did his staff. The slate was wiped clean. Anyone curious about how much these folks made in severance would naturally check the sunshine list. If they did, they would not find any answers. Minister, why is your government hiding this salary information? And if it can't get this much right, what else is it hiding? Good question. Thank you. Finance. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're not hiding anything. We're the, we're the party that brought forward a, an Open and Transparency Act. We're the one that are disclosing more information than any other government. In fact, C.D. Howe Institute, and uh, it's in the public domain, C.D. Howe Institute has just ranked Ontario as one of the top governments in Canada for full disclosure and integrity of our numbers. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to do that and uh, just read the, uh, the books, Mr. Speaker. They're there to be seen. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary, please. Minister. The Sunshine List is one of Ontario's longest-running measures of government accountability. Three years ago, the Sunshine List showed former eHealth executive and Deputy Health Minister Ron Sapsberg took home $762,000 despite the fact that he had quit the year before. After that story broke, Premier McGrinty vowed, quote, we're going to shine a light on all expenses so Ontarios will know who exactly is spending what exactly, unquote. Minister, if you're so dedicated to transparency, why can you not even meet the low bar set by the former Premier? Good question. Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Sunshine List exists and it's displayed, and we tell uh, the public and we disclose the information that's required. Uh, we've enhanced our Transparency Act to provide even further information and greater integrity of the numbers. Uh, uh, as I said, CDI Institute, even Forbes has, uh, has illustrated Ontario as one of the top jurisdictions, top governments in, uh, in the world in terms of its ability to have uh, numbers with great integrity and transparency, and we will continue to do so. And I should remind the member opposite that their own numbers that they've claimed in their platform has not exceeded, has not even met the targets that we've been able to achieve thus far. We're outpacing that own part, that party opposite, who claims that they can even do better, and their numbers show that they would even do worse, Mr. Speaker. We'll move ahead yes, and we'll do what's necessary for the benefit of all the people of Ontario. Mr. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. The uh, Minister of the Environment is warned. Carry on. Mr. Burton, Quartha Lakes will come to order. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. The Niagara Region is united in calling for a daily GO train service to Niagara Falls. Twelve Niagara mayors and the Chamber of Commerce have all called on this government to bring GO to Niagara and to make it a top priority to improve the region's economy. Niagara Falls faces one of the highest unemployment rates in the province. The Niagara Regional Chair, Gary Burrell, says GO can be a game changer for our local economy. Will the minister commit to a timeline to finally bring GO train service to Niagara? Thank you, Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the question from uh, the honourable member. We are working right now 
we are in the middle of the largest expansion of GO in our history. We have uh, exceeded now $10 billion investment in GO, and we have now extended service, as you know, and I take that train on the weekend because I cycle in St. Catharines in Niagara. The, to move to all-day two-way GO service to Niagara, we have issues of canal crossing, track acquisition, which costs hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. So we're trying to build that into our plan. One way the, the member opposite and his party could help would be supporting the government on its efforts to bring in the new revenue tools so that we can actually pay for a greater extension. So we look forward to working with the Answer. Party, Mr. Speaker, and we look forward to some clarity on their position on funding transit, Mr. Speaker, because that's all that's holding us back Thank from you. doing it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, a petition is circulating in Niagara to bring daily GO train service to Niagara that already has more than 2,400 signatures. The unemployed and the underemployed in Niagara can't wait any longer. This government has had years of studies and discussions on bringing a daily commuter rail service to Niagara. The time for promise is over. When will this government bring daily GO Computer Go Rail service to Niagara. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, we actually have not been doing that. We have not been studying and studying and studying. We've been investing. $10 billion, $14 billion in infrastructure. Now, I say to the honourable member, because I think we would agree on this, the, the party opposite spent $1.4 billion on infrastructure. We spent $14 billion. And for 30 years in this province, we underinvested in infrastructure. So we are making up for a 30-year backlog. How do we accelerate what is already the biggest investment in GO and rapid transit in Ontario's history? It takes more money. We do not have a majority in this House. So we look to our friends in the third party to get greater clarity on a range of revenue tools that they could support. Answer. We're told by you you support transit, but it takes more than words. It takes writing a check. So we need to raise the money to write the check. Thank and you. we look to the member and his party to support us in Thank that, you. Mr. Speaker. Member, a new question, the member from Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, the warm weather is a welcome change to my constituents in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood. It's that time of year when everyone wants to get outside and tour, not only in my community, but communities across Ontario. With the change in weather, more bicycles and running shoes have finally come out of storage. Members of my community are able to tour on foot or on bike and see what Ontario has to offer. Although the warm weather is welcome, it also raises concerns about cycling and pedestrian safety. Speaker, I was delighted to hear about the introduction of Bill 173, keeping Ontario's roads safe. Through you to the minister, I'd like to hear what is included in this bill that will help keep my constituents safe as they enjoy this warm weather and tour around communities across Ontario. Thank you, Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Speaker. There, is three, th there are two threes in this. One, uh, I want to give credit to all members of this House because this bill contains ideas from both the opposition parties as well as the government, Mr. Speaker. They work. The other, the, the other three is not just three parties, but three groups. One, Mr. Speaker, for motorists, this will uh, change the inspection standards and introduce very strong powers for the registrar to make sure that Ontarians are protected from buying substandard uh, used vehicles and to get those unsafe vehicles off the road. Very big priority for motorists, Mr. Speaker. For cyclists, this in introduced things like the one meter rule and dooring, which will actually remove the biggest yes, causes, sir. the coroner has told us, are, are risks to the lives of all of us who cycle. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is also really important because this will allow municipalities a greater range of options with pedestrian Thank crossings you. and give pedestrians more rights on the road, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The time is up for question period. The member from Etobicoke Centre on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to um, offer a warm welcome to the Trillium Gift of Life Network as they join us today in the Legislature, and to encourage every member here to come this evening to a reception at 5.30 in the dining room, where you have the opportunity to hear from those, the families who have given, 
and to those of the families who have received. Thank you very much. Thank you. Attorney General, on a point of order. To correct my record in answering Please go ahead. the member from London, where I said I, uh, I have something like I agree that there is a violence in the workplace, I meant violence in the correctional facilities. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, member for Nipissing, on a point of order. Uh, point of privilege, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I will uh, briefly summarize the many precedents and arguments that I put forward in my written submission to you this morning. I rise today after providing you with the appropriate notice regarding my intention to stand on a point of privilege for contempt of this legislature. Last week, the Ontario PC caucus was given a rollout calendar prepared by the Liberal government's self-proclaimed budget leaking. Do you want me to wait a moment while they leave, Speaker? I'm still listening. I'm taking notes. Thank you. The Liberals' uh, self-proclaimed budget leaking team it outlined 39 budget policy announcements and $5.7 billion in additional spending over the course of 27 days in the lead-up to the May budget. Before rising on a point of privilege, Speaker, I waited to see if this calendar was an accurate portrayal <clears throat> of the government's plan to announce budget in initiatives. On Friday, it became clear that this was indeed the case. On Friday, the minister responsible for seniors made the government's first budget announcement regarding the seniors grant program. This event can be found on page three of the document titled Pre-Doc Communications Rollout, Rollout or the Budget Leaking Team that I gave you. The issue at hand is what appears to be a coordinated effort by the Liberal government to make budget announcements outside of the legislature via public relations events. The fact that this government has formed a team of Ministry of Finance officials and labeled them as, quote, budget leaking team, demonstrates that the government fully intends on leaking the budget as a public relations stunt. O'Brien and Bosk described the budget as a, quote, formal budget presentation offering a comprehensive assessment of the financial standing of the government and giving an overview of the nation's economic condition, quote. They go on to state that, quote, there is a long-standing tradition of keeping the contents of the budget secret until the Minister of Finance actually presents it in the House. Quote, Unfortunately, under this Liberal government, we have seen budget announcements become more prominent and frequent. These announcements release key components of the budget of the, uh, to the public before the opposition gets to hold the government to account in the legislature. Quite frankly, I'm concerned that the government's behavior is a potential contempt of this legislature. Speaker, I want to be explicitly clear today. I am not claiming that there was a breach of members' privilege inside the legislature, but rather I believe that the government's decision to hold public relations events to announce bub pub uh, budget initiative amounts to a contempt of the legislature because it lessens the role of the legislature. Parliamentary experts support this position. O'Brien and Bosk state that, quote, all breaches of privilege are contempts of the House, but not all contempts are necessarily breaches of privilege. Erskine May describes contempt as, quote, an act or omission which obstructs or impedes either House of Parliament in their performance of its functions. He then goes on to stay, say that, quote, indignities offered to the House by words spoken or writings published reflecting on its character or proceedings have been punished by both the Lords and Commons upon the principle that such acts tend to obstruct the Houses in their performance of their functions by diminish, uh, diminishing the respect due to them, quote. That is why I'm calling on you to intervene in this matter. It is concerning that this Liberal government is more focused on rolling out their budget initiatives outside of the legislature and diminishing the respect that is due to the function of the House. It's an example of the government ignoring the House and the fact that they are accountable to Ontarians via the MPPs that sit in this assembly, purposely making budget announcements well in advance of a budget motion or bill being tabled in the House goes against what we do as parliamentarians and what we do in Parliament. The role of parliamentarians is to hold the government accountable.
When the government bypasses Parliament, it is an affront to parliamentary democracy. Finally, I want to draw the Speaker to the precedent from this Legislature, which su supports my point of privilege. I refer to you, Speaker, to Speaker Carr's ruling from May 8, 2003, regarding the government's presentation of the Magna budget. Speaker Carr's ruling focused on the fact that when budgets are presented outside of the House, quote, there is a danger that the representative role of each and every member of this House is undermined. Uh, is undermined, that respect for the institution is diminished, and that Parliament is rendered irrelevant. Quote. Carr went on to say that, quote, parliamentary de democracy is not vindicated by the government conducting a generally one-sided uh, public relations event on the budget well in advance of the members having an opportunity to hold the government to account for the budget in this chamber. Quote. This is precisely what is at issue here. The government has employed a budget-leaking team to make budget announcements to the public long before members of this legislature see it. In the Magna case, Carr ruled that a prima facie case of contempt existed because the issue raised too many questions and concerns. In his ruling, he expressed the uneasiness about the road the government was going. He found that, quote, it is one thing not to make traditional budget speech in the House because the government is backed into such a decision by an ongoing House process or a budget leak. It is quite another for the government to have a deliberate plan not to do so, quote. Speaker, in 2003, Speaker Carr clearly ruled that the Magna budget was a mistake. This is why we were so shocked when the Liberals planned and then executed the same thing over a year later. In conclusion, members of this House are concerned with the recent, recent actions by the government not only to employ a budget-leaking team, but to make budgetary announcements in advance of the budget. It is concerning that this has been a growing trend. The government is more focused on media and public relations rather than being accountable, accountable to the members of this legislature. Announcing budget initiatives outside of the legislature removes the function of our parliament and our ability to hold the government to account. Any ruling other than a prima facie case of contempt will inevitably lead to even more egregious abuse. Thank you, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. The House Leader for the Third Party. Well, Mr. Speaker, I uh, don't want to take a lot of time, but I want to weigh in on what is this uh, particular point of privilege that's being raised by the member. We, we need to remember the main function of what this legislature is about is approval of money. That's what this thing is all about. Dating back to the model parliament of 1295 is when the people decided, or in those days, those, uh, the, the barons and others, decided that you could not allow the king, in this case the executive, uh, the right to spend money and the right to uh, tax without having uh, parliament do the actual approval. And so back to 1295, and that's a pretty long history, there is uh, all kinds of evidence where essentially the executive in this case, but back then the king, is is essentially precluded from being able to spend money and to tax people without the approval of the legislature. So when you have a government that's essentially out there trying to find ways of getting around announcing things uh, that are quite frankly uh, re directly related to the budget, it's a diminishment of the role of this House. The members of this House are Primarily, our, our large responsibility, if you take a look at uh, what the uh, Constitution calls for in regards to the makeup of the legislature, is to approve the budget and to make sure that we give approval to both the taxation, if we decided to do that, in this case probably wouldn't, uh, but on the quay or when it came to the expenditure. So when a government is trying to get around the provision of what this parliament is all about, I think it takes uh, us a, a, a responsibility of stepping back and looking at what is really being done here. And I would just argue this is again just a weakening of what I think is the role and responsibility of this legislature when a government decides to try to get around what the responsibility of the legislature is. And I would ask you to give this all due consideration. Thank you. Government House Leader. Thank you. Uh very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to, uh, to respond on behalf of uh, the government. 
Mr. Speaker, I've had a chance to review the presentation uh, that was uh, sent by the member from Nipissing to myself and the other House leaders uh, several hours ago. And uh, I would argue that the point of privilege uh, he has raised is completely without merit. The presentation uh, has confused the concept of budget secrecy, which is a political convention with the presentation of a budget outside of the House. The former, Mr. Speaker, does not give rise to contempt. Previous speakers' rulings confirm that budget secrecy is a matter of parliamentary convention and not a matter of privilege. In one example, for, uh, in one example that I'll share with you, Speaker Sove noted that a breach of budget secrecy has, and I quote, no impact on the privileges of a member. She went on to say that it, and I quote again, has to do with the conduct of a minister in the exercise of his administrative responsibility. In a May 9, 1983 ruling, the Speaker of this House noted, and I quote, I am unable to find any precedent which states that the matter of budget secrecy is one which may be treated as a question of privilege, end of quote. The Speaker went on to say, and again I quote, budget secrecy is a political convention, as is the practice that the Treasurer presents his budget in the House before discussing it in any other public forum. It has nothing to do with parliamentary privilege, end of quote. Indeed, prior rulings make it clear that it's appropriate to announce policy and publish material for consultation and take reasonable planning measures in advance of the passage of legislation provided that it does not adversely impact the legislative process or rights of the members in the legislative process. On February 22, 2009, in this uh, legislature, Mr. Speaker, Speaker Curling stated the following when ruling on a similar motion, and again I quote, there is nothing wrong with anticipation per se. It happens a lot. The issue is whether the announcement goes further and reflects adversely on the parliamentary process." End of quote. He went on to say, and again I quote, "...in my opinion, the wording and tone of the documents are not dismissive of the legislative role of the House. On the contrary, they indicate that the government had plans and proposals that require not only negotiation, but also the introduction and passage of legislation. In particularly, the board letter and press release contain conditional phrases such as, quote, intends to introduce legislation, close quote, we are proposing, quote, and legislation that if passed. And that's the end of Speaker, uh, the excerpt from Speaker Curling's ruling that I wanted to share with you. The only case cited by the member from Nipissing that relates to the budget process is, of course, the May 8th, 2003 prima facie uh, finding of contempt made by Speaker Gary Carr. In that case, the member's own party presented a budget speech in a private facility during a time when the House was prorogued. This is obviously an entirely different set of circumstances. There has not been any attempt or intention to deliver the budget speech, this particular budget, Mr. Speaker, outside of this House. The Minister of Finance fully intends to deliver the budget speech in the House in the normal co course. It is important to note that it was the PCs, Mr. Speaker, I close on this, who first made the information that is the subject of this point of privilege public. So if the member truly believes that, the present, that presenting this information before the formal introduction of the budget is a matter of contempt, why would he be so quick to make it public? It's clear, Mr. Speaker, that the point of privilege which the member from Nipissing raises is without merit. And uh, I, of course, Mr. Speaker, will provide you with the references that uh, I've raised today as well as uh, my colleagues uh, in the other parties. Thank you. The uh, official opposition uh, House Leader. Yeah, I would just point out, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I, I do this uh, respectfully, but the Honourable House Leader for the government side uh, hinges his argument on a point of privilege of, I assume, an individual member. We are seeking a prima facie case of contempt of the House, and uh, as you know from precedent, uh, there is a great distinction. And I would just uh, uh, remind you of page two of our submission and ask you to seriously consider that. Thank all members for their contribution and uh, discussion on this particular topic. I will reserve my ruling uh, for a later date uh, in order to uh, devote some time to this uh, to ensure the ruling is appropriate. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.